This is Living Power with Dan Hurst. They saw the problem, God saw a solution. And he gave them the responsibility by telling them, give them something to eat. He gave them the responsibility to feed the people to meet their needs. Now, if we stop the lesson right now, we would stop with what most of us have dealt with our whole life. We know that God wants us to do something, but we don't know how to do it. And so we go through life frustrated trying to do something that God tells us to do, and we're just frustrated Christians. Because we know that God wants us to do certain things and to be a certain way and to accomplish certain things, but we don't know what to do, but, so we think, well, I've got to figure it out on my own. God's given me certain abilities to, to think certain ways, so I'll figure it out myself. I'll use my own talents and abilities and good charm, you know, good looks and charm to accomplish what it is that I have to accomplish. And we get so frustrated in our Christian walk because we're, we've stopped right at the point where if we stopped at this story that the disciples would have been at if they had just said, okay, we've got to figure out a way to do it ourselves. If they had taken that thought, if they had decided to do it on their own, said Jesus said, you feed them, and they said, Okay, we'll figure out a way. Call a committee meeting. We'll get together. We'll start a fundraiser, and we'll send somebody into town to bring food up. We'll cater. Uh, anyway, um, so Jesus said, you give them something to eat. If they had just taken on the responsibility at that point, it would have been an abysmal failure, an abysmal failure. Alone, listen to this, alone they did not have what was needed to accomplish the task, but that was not a problem for Jesus. He instructed them to bring what they had, to him. If they had not listened further, if they had just assumed at that point, okay, well, we know what we're supposed to do, let's go do it, they would have failed because they did not have what was needed to accomplish the task. But that, not having what they needed to accomplish the task, was not a problem for Jesus. It was a problem for them, but it wasn't a problem for Jesus. When God calls you to do something, when God has a purpose and a plan for your life, you do not have what it takes to accomplish that task. But that's not a problem for God. It's a problem for you. It's not a problem for God. He instructed them to bring to Him what they, what they did have. Which must have been a little embarrassing. Is it embarrassing to you? God says He wants you to accomplish this task. And you look at it and you think, I... First of all, I'm not qualified. I don't have what it takes to do this. I certainly don't have the resources. And God says, bring me what you got. Well, God, it's so little. It's five loaves and two fish. And God says, bring me what you got. Let's start there. Because, see, for you, it is impossible. For God, it isn't. The issue that God was dealing with at this point was not that it was just five loaves and two fish. That wasn't the issue. You see, really, I mean, if you want to know the truth of the matter, God p could have picked up a stone and turned it into a meal. I mean, he had that capability of doing that. He's a miracle worker, remember? He could have, that was not the point. The point wasn't that he didn't have what, it, what was available, that uh, he didn't have anything to work with. I mean, he did. He had, there were rocks on the ground. He could have done that. That wasn't the point. The point was he was teaching the disciples there's a way that you deal with these issues and these crises in life. I have a purpose and a plan for your life. And it begins with me teaching you about the possibilities for life. If I can just get you to see the possibilities, then you can begin to see that God can accomplish something that he wants to accomplish. It's bigger and beyond our imagination. Bring me what you've got. Now, the responsibility was still theirs to feed the people. That was their responsibility. He had told them, you feed the people. He didn't say... Okay, fine. You can't do it. I'll do it for you. He didn't say that. He didn't say, okay, if you can't do it, I'll take care of it. Don't worry about it. Sit back and watch. He didn't do that. And he doesn't do that for you either. He has a responsibility that he's given you, and the responsibility is still yours, just as the responsibility was still theirs, to feed the people. But the means to do it was Jesus' responsibility. Jesus was saying to his disciples, look, when I call you to do something, I will give you the means to accomplish it. Now listen to this statement. God never calls us to a ministry that we can handle on our own. God never calls us to a ministry that we can handle on our own. 
If you are accomplishing a ministry that you can accomplish on your own, you are in the wrong ministry. You just simply are. If you cannot accomplish, if you cannot accomplish that ministry that God's called you to, you've probably found the ministry that God wants for you. I will tell you right now, teaching is one of the most complicated things that I do. It's a struggle for me. It's a struggle to get in and study and search and find and look for the application, look for the, look for the application for my life, and, and then find out how to teach that in such a way that makes sense to other people. And I think sometimes I don't do that. But the point is that it's, it's not, teaching is not a strength for me. It's a calling, but it's not a strength. I'm a much better underwear model. Well, I am. <laughs> Teaching does not come naturally for me. It's not something that I do easily. All right. <laughs> Listen, the truth of the matter is God never called you to a ministry that you can accomplish on your own. He doesn't. He doesn't. You do not have the means to accomplish the ministry that God has directed you to accomplish. But that is not a problem in God's eyes. The ministry that God has called you to is not a problem in God's eyes. The things that God wants to accomplish through the circumstances of your life are not a problem in God's eyes because God's not limited by the circumstances. When God looked at that situation with those 18,000 people on the side of, that, uh, side of that mountain and said, I'm going to teach these disciples something about depending on me and helping them to understand, think of the possibilities, he looked at the situation and it wasn't, the circumstances were not, the, did not limit God. God didn't go, whoa, we've got to figure out a way to pull this one off. That wasn't an issue. It wasn't an issue for God. He will provide the means, you simply have to bring what you have uh, and use what he gives you. You just simply have to bring what he's given you and use what he gives you. Five loaves, two fishes. Not much, but it's all they had. What will you do with what you do have? What do you do with what you have been given? Do you just take it and say, it's not enough, and so I just put it back on the shelf? and wait for something else to come along when maybe I can use that? Or do you recognize it's not about what I have, it's about what God does? So let's look at the implement, implementation. It's important to, I think, take a moment and reflect on something that Jesus instructed at this point. I love this. Um, in John 6.10 says, Jesus said, have the people sit down. And there was much grass in the place, so the men sat down, about 5,000 in number, plus the, uh, the women and children. Now, a similar incident reported in Mark uh, indicates that, and we learned something that may have been implemented in this particular case also, although it's not indicated, but we can kind of deduce that because it, Jesus seemed to do work patterns, and this, this may, have, may have happened here also. In Mark chapter 6, verse 39, then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass, so they, so they sat down in groups by hundreds and fifties. So he takes the 18,000 people, he may have, and I think he did, took the 18,000 people and he breaks them up into groups of hundreds and fifties. Now what we should pick up here, in, on, here is on the important uh, task of breaking critical issues into smaller, more manageable blocks or pieces. What Jesus didn't, he didn't say, have everybody sit down, all 18,000 people. Everybody Everybody, could you, could I have your attention, please? Time out. I don't know if they said time out in Hebrew, but uh, time out. Everybody sit down. He didn't do that. Made it even more complicated. I need groups of 50s and 100s. Count off and get into groups of 50s and 50s, 50s and 100s, people. Everybody in groups of 50s and 100s. Come on, people, we don't have all night. Come on, groups of 50s and 100s. 
And he finally got them all. I could just see Mary Sinclair doing this, can't you? <laughs> and he got groups of 50s and 100s and got them all, all, all to sit down. And by the way, he had the disciples do it. It wasn't Jesus. That did, he had the disciples do it. It's, it was part of that task, part of that responsibility of them doing it. And then <laughs> note something that very important that Jesus did here in John chapter 6, verse 11. Then Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated. So also the fish, as much as they wanted. Now, it was sardine, so they wouldn't want much. It's pretty disgusting food. I mean, if you really want to think about it. When we went on a mission trip, uh, one of the first ones, I don't know, second, maybe second, or th- I don't know which one it was. Uh, Mike O'Connor and Stan Redford went on that trip. And I'm, I'm not making this up. They packed half of their suitcase with sardines and crackers. I didn't know about it until we got down there. And I said, did you think we weren't going to have any food down here? And they said, well, we don't know if there would be anything we liked. You're in one of the most amazing countries in the world that has all of this fruit growing everywhere. Bananas, mangoes, coconuts, you know, and we have, we have beans and rice and we have chicken cooked in palm oil, the absolute best chicken in the world. And we have all, we have all this incredible food here and you didn't think we were going to have enough to eat? And so you brought sardines <laughs> in a can. And this is no lie. We, one day the, the, uh, the little family that lived across the street from the building that we were working on asked us to come over and have dinner. And uh, some of you were on that trip with us. But we, we went over there and they, they did serve up. Um, they cooked up chicken. Well, the chicken was outstanding. But they also had some, some I think it was beef. It was really more the texture of a shoe. And uh, the dog, it took a dog. We, how long did it take that dog to eat it? The whole time we were there, didn't it? That dog chewed on a little piece of meat the whole time we were there. It was like, just kept chewing and chewing and chewing and chewing. And I finally figured out that piece of meat that that dog is eating, that's Patterson's piece of meat that he, he gave it to the dog. He somehow snuck that piece of meat to the dog because he couldn't eat it. You chewed on it for a while, too, yeah. Um, but anyway, so they were, all, uh, they were all busy. We were all eating and, and eating well, and we were sitting out under the mango trees, and it was really, really, it was, it was really quite enjoyable. I went back across, the, and O'Connor and Redford weren't there. So I went back across the street to see if they were still at the little chapel there, and sure enough, they were there, and they were sitting there eating sardines and crackers. And I said, you guys, you just missed out on this spectacular meal, except for the beef. And, uh, you, you know, they said, oh, oh, we got sardines, you know, we, we have sardines. And then they said, oh, we'll come over. So they came over, and when they came over, you could smell the sardines a mile away. <laughs> and uh, and one, of the pe- one of the ladies said, uh, w- what did they eat? And I said, well, they had some cans of, of uh, fish. And they said, did it go bad? <laughs> I said, yes, it did. Where were we? <clears throat> oh, so I want you to see something important that Jesus did here. He took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed the loaves to all that were seated and the fish as much as they wanted. Now, why did Jesus do that? Why did, we, why did he make a point of that with the 18,000? Well, the point was this. He taught us, by example, to always depend on God as our source. What he was saying was, by breaking the bread and thanking God for the, 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 uh, the loaves and for the fish, he was acknowledging that God was his source. Really, I mean, that's, and that example is given. That's why we pray before meals. 
It isn't because it's just a habit that we were taught to do by our grandparents. It's something where we acknowledge that God is our source. He is our provider. He is what we, what we, what we acknowledge. I love the fact that uh, we have little children living with us right now um, uh, until uh, uh, my son Eric and Jen move into their house in, in July. They're all living with us. And uh, we'll sit down for dinner. And every time we sit down for dinner, Mona says, we have to pray. I love that that's important to her. I don't know that she gets it. I don't know if she understands it. But Grandpa has to pray. And so, and so it's a time of sitting together and, and acknowledging that God is our source. He provides for us. And to thank Him for making us a family and giving us a home and, and giving us food. It's not just a ritual that we go through. It's an acknowledgement that God is our source. All that we have comes from Him. And what He was saying, not only to the people, the 18,000 people there, but to the 12 disciples was, guys, I want you to see something. God is our source. All of this that's about to happen, what you guys are about to see happen, comes from God the Father. He was acknowledging the solution before they even saw the solution. He was acknowledging the solution before they even saw the solution. You simply cannot accomplish what needs to happen within your own abilities and resources. You have to rely on God. And that's what Jesus was saying. Let's acknowledge where this actually comes from, our source here. And what were the results? The results were in John chapter 6, verse 12 through 13. And when they had eaten their fill, he told his disciples. Now stop right there. It just moves something where, God, thank you for providing us. We have five loaves and two fish. And the very next words were, and when they had eaten their fill. When they had gotten enough to eat. I mean, what happened between, thank you for the food that you're providing for us, God, amen, and when they had had their fill. What ha- Isn't that kind of an interesting little gap there from one sentence to the next? That's the way God works in your life. One moment you, are, you don't have a solution, one moment you don't have enough, and the next moment you're realizing you have had your fill. God has met the need in your life. And all of a sudden it's just like, wow! Does it always happen that fast? No. But it is the way that God does work sometimes, many times. Where it's just like God works in such a way where He takes from a point where we don't have to where we have all that we need in that particular situation. So when they had eaten their fill, he told the disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. Now, it's important to understand that when we look at this passage, we think that we're talking about like the bit, you know, the, the scraps, you know, that you push down the garbage drain. Uh, that's not what it's talking about. What it's talking about was the food that was left over. The pieces of fish and the, and, the, and the bread. You know, remember, the pieces of bread had been broken. I mean, it was, they weren't whole loaves. They'd been broken and multiplied. And so it's talking about what was left over. Not the piece, not the bones and, and stuff. It wasn't that. It was the actual leftover food. In other words, what God had done was He had fed fifteen to 18,000 people and there, were still, there was still food left over. Kind of like an open class potluck. And it was the greatest potluck in the world. There were leftovers, except they didn't have dessert. And look what happens. He tells them, gather them up, and they take 12 baskets with all of the leftovers from the loaves of fish, the loaves and fish. Now, there's been all kinds of speculation by theologians uh, as to what the 12 baskets represent here. Do they represent the 12 apostles? Do they represent the, the 12 tribes? And so forth and so on. You know, theologians have a tendency to try to overthink these things, I think. Because I think it's really, I think the, there's no indication of anything special happening with those 12 baskets of food. So I suspect that the answer is pretty simple. In other words, there was no meaning to that. There was, we aren't told later on in the scripture, well, the 12 baskets represented da 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 I'll tell you what I think it. I'll tell you what I think it says. Remember, remember how exhausted Jesus and the disciples were. Remember how at the beginning of the lesson I, I talked about that. They, they were just their life was just at breakneck speed at that point. They were worn out. 
I believe that this was Jesus' way of teaching His disciples that He would meet their needs also. And the baskets of food were for them and their families. There were 12, 12 of them, remember? And He took the 12 baskets and He said, Guys, I want you to gather this up and each of you will have a basket of food. I think it was God's way of saying that I will take care of you. When you do what I tell you to do, when you obey me, when you do it the way I tell you to do it, when you trust me, when you don't have enough and recognize that I do, and you just simply go and obey and do what I tell you to do, I'll meet your needs. I'll provide for you. The baskets of food were for them and their families. Later on, uh, the apostle said in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, My God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory. And the way I've written that sentence on the, on, the, uh, on the PowerPoint, I want you to see that need is part of ministry. It's also part of glory. God sees the need in your life as a way to reveal His glory. God sees, let me say it again, God sees the need in your life as a way to reveal His glory. God doesn't reveal His glory through your your abundance. God doesn't reveal His glory in your life through the lack of problems. God doesn't reveal His need in your life because everything is going smoothly. God reveals His glory when there is need. God reveals His glory when there is need. God reveals His glory when there is need. I love what Psalm 27, we close with this, Psalm 27, verses 1 through 3. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When evil men advance against me to devour my flesh, when my enemies and my foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though an army besiege me, my heart will not fear. Though war break out against me, even then I will be confident. When God speaks, God acts. When God touches the need in your life, He reveals His glory. Many of you have some overwhelming needs in your life. I know some of them. You've shared them with me. They're heartbreaking. They're mind-boggling. If we were to start sharing some of those in this room, it would just, we would all be in tears. We would be so overwhelmed by the pain and the hurt and the overwhelming circumstances. And we would think, how in the world will we ever see a solution here? I want you to know that my God shall supply all your need according to His riches and glory. Let me rephrase it. My God will take your need and reveal His glory. Let's pray. On behalf of Dan Hurst and the Open Class, we want to thank you for watching. We hope it was a blessing.